Thank you all for coming today uh, for this important session. And thank you to our panel for being here. I am Lisa Gubernick. I am the VP of membership for NCJW. We're bringing you these virtual sessions as a way for our NCJW members and non-members to stay connected and informed. Today's session is called Your Voice Matters because we thought now more than ever, it is critical for us as women to make our voices heard. Our three panelists have great perspectives as busy career women who also find the time become in, to become involved in civic engagement. Sarah Martin, Maxine Clark, and Heather Silverman will answer questions about why they became engaged in civic action and how to go about becoming involved. I will ask all three panelists questions and keep the chat open for you, the audience, to ask any questions you may have. First, let's start with a video. Um, it's called Action and it is produced for NCJW in celebration of its 125th anniversary. Hopefully it will inspire you. Take it away, Lauren. We love to do our community. We love to do our community service, but we know that it's really important to have systemic change that impacts more people and helps more people. We stand here, all of us, to pursue health care justice for all. Our expert advocacy and our nationwide network make NCJW the best leader to defend our rights. There are children too. There are children too. Bringing people together, not allowing people even have a glimpse that they are in this by themselves. Rather, it's it's the flip side. Service plus advocacy, that's what we do. No legislator should go to sleep at night or be able to look at himself in the morning when he wakes up without our words ringing in his ears. Take action now. Your voice must be heard. Thank you. So we are honored to have our three important panelists with us today, and we thank them for their time. First is Maxine Clark, founder of Build-A-Bear Workshop, CEO of the Clark Fox Family Foundation and chief inspirator at the Del Mar Divine, a project to transform a dilapidated neighborhood building into a multi-use real estate development set to open in 2021. Maxine believes it's important to invest in K through 12 public education, as well as mentor women and minority entrepreneurs. She launched blueprint4.com as an easy and free mobile app to help all families navigate the best summer activities, pre-college programs and career options for their families. Maxine is also a managing partner of Prosper Women's Capital, a St. Louis based fund created to invest in women-owned businesses and a member of the Board of Advisors of the Lewis and Clark Ventures, a St. Louis-based private equity firm and is a trusted advisor and mentor to several women and minority-owned businesses. We also have Sarah Martin. She is currently a consultant representing a nonprofit, representing nonprofit interests in the state legislature. She is a true believer in social justice, serving as co-chair of NCJW's first human trafficking task force and later co-chairing our trafficking conference in 2015. She also introduced the NCJW advocacy team to statewide and local elected officials. Sarah just won the election to serve as Alderwoman in St. Louis 11th district. Her husband is Jake Hummel, a state senator, so Sarah is exposed to politics in her own home and Heather Silverman. She serves as the Director of Policy and Evaluation for the NCJW St. Louis. Heather's areas of expertise include economic justice issues, human trafficking, community organizing, and effective legislative advocacy. She was elected to represent the people of the first ward of the, Creve Corps, of the city of Creve Corps in 2018 and was recently reelected. 
Heather's the current chair of the St. Louis Ending Violence Against Women Committee on Economic Justice. She's chair of the Olive Boulevard, Boulevard TDD and president of the Creep Corps City Council. And thank you all for being here today and especially to Sarah who just had surgery yesterday. So we appreciate you coming on here. Um, I'm going to ask the panel the same questions. Um, and if you have any in the audience, you can put it in the chat. And as we go along, I will include those questions as well. So we can start uh, with the first question for our panel. Um, how did you get involved in politics and why did you get involved in civic engagement given everything you already have going on with your busy careers and for a few of you with kids? And we can start with Maxine if you'd like to start with that question. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. For, uh, thank you, Lisa, for that great question. For me, it started when I was a little girl. I'm not sure if I was you know, five or six or seven, but uh, I remember specifically when I was about 10 years old and my mother um, had me on the street corner with her working to register voters. And also um, my mother was a volunteer for, for John Kennedy. And so she gave all the kids had a sash that said kids for Kennedy. And once I got that sash on, I wanted to go with my mother every weekend to register voters and to uh, talk about uh, John Kennedy for president. That was the official, you know, clothing. And so I was so excited. But uh, my mother was uh, a political activist. She worked for Eleanor Roosevelt. She was her private traveling secretary during World War II. And uh, my mother learned everything that she knew about social justice uh, from Eleanor. And when, after World War II, she moved to Miami where my father was stationed and uh, they, um, Eleanor helped her start a school for children with Down syndrome, except those days it was called mongoloidism. And so my mother was always an activist for the differently abled as she referred to them. And so we were constantly going, um, you know, to uh, events, always women, always women rising up to, to the challenge to make it better for children and families. And I just didn't know any different. I, I a lot of times rolled my eyes like many of us do when our mothers are trying to make us do something we don't want to do. But I'm so glad and I, I, it didn't take me long into my teenage years to know that that was going to be part of my future as well. Thank you. Sarah, do you want to answer that question? Sure. Uh, my story is a little similar. Um, I knew, uh, I think about in second grade, I wanted to be involved in politics. I wanted to do journalism and politics, uh, which I did go on to earn a journalism degree. Um, and I do use that to a certain extent, but it's not in the way I thought I would. But um, no, I, my mom was a huge news consumer. We always had several papers in our house and um, I wanted to be just like Cokie Roberts. And uh, I had a blazer in second grade and I was, uh, I played Bill Clinton in the debates that year. And I just knew that that was, uh, I wanted to have an impact in policy. And uh, I ended up going to University of Missouri where I started volunteering on campaigns right away. And Gene Carnahan's was actually the first campaign I got involved in in Missouri. And uh, I got the bug and just went on from there. Thank you, Heather. I think my story uh, mirrors similar aspects to, to Sarah and Maxine. So um, my parents were, were both very uh, active in politics. Um, and when I was about eight years old, I went on this camping trip and they kept telling us through the camping trip that we should leave the area we were in nicer than we found it. And like kids do, I like fixated on that and decided that like, everywhere I went for a while, I needed to leave it nicer than I found it. And so like, this was really a little bit uh, disconcerting to my parents because we would be out and I'd find trash on the ground and like pick it up. Um, and my mom was like, you really need to find a better <laughs> way to, like, that's lovely, but let's, let's think about other ways than picking up dirt off the ground. Um, and at the same time, uh, my parents were really active with uh, Jerry Rothman Surratt's campaign, if any of you remember that. Um, and I got to know Jerry quite well, um, and, and even at eight did a little work for her. Um, it was very good at putting stamps on things. So that's how I got involved um, and stayed involved and really why I continue to be involved in, and to your question about children, um, you can see it starts young. So it's not an excuse, it's a reason to, to continue to do this work. Thank you. 
And so for for Maxine, did you ever consider running for office? That's my first question. And then for Sarah and Heather, why did you decide to run for office? So Maxine, did you ever consider running for office? Well, I think I intended to. Like Sarah, I was a journalism major and I went to law school right after um, college in Washington, D.C. And I had to go to work to pay for law school. And I went to work for the May Company, in their, their version of Famous Bar there. And um, mm -hmm. my boss got sick and I had to jump in and I took a leave of absence from law school. I'm still on that leave of absence. But I intended to be, you know, I wanted to be a judge and I, uh, and try cases, especially around civil rights. So I thought that maybe I would get back to it. And not that you have to be a lawyer to run for office, obviously you don't, but in those days uh, for a woman to run for office, you had to have your credentials uh, and much older than, than Sarah and Heather. Uh, so I, I just really kind of just got into the work groove and decided to you know, make as much money as I possibly could do as many things through business um, and donate to candidates and support candidates. So that kind of fell apart, even though people still ask me, I'm way too old to do that now, but I th I'd really rather support all the young candidates that are out there that are um, excited and have ideas for the future and uh, put my energy and, uh, and, and funding behind them. Thank you. Heather, do you want to go? I see Sarah's muted. Sure. Um, so I, I, I been involved with politics for for years but never uh never ever thought I would run for office and um when people first uh started asking me if if it was something I would be interested in I um laughed and told them no absolutely not and one day uh Jill Shoup called and asked if I would be interested in, in running for office and I uh sort of laughed like I I did with everyone else and she and her very uh, Jill Way said, I'm not being funny, Heather. And um, that was kind of the push I, I needed to to take the step. And I think like many after 2016, there there was no longer this imposter syndrome fear, right? Like um, we saw who could be elected. So if they could be elected, why couldn't we? And we knew we could do just as well, if not probably better than than who we had already elected. Very true. <laughs> Sarah, why, why did you decide to run? For office? Uh, like Heather, I've always worked in politics and I never wanted to run for office. Um, that's the question you always ask a potential staffer that you're interviewing. Do you want to run for office? And they say, yes, you don't hire them. Uh, but <laughs> I, I never did. Um, but I, in 2016 or after 2016, uh, my, my bio needs to get updated a little bit, but it was 2017 when I ran. Um, well, I was angry, uh, obviously, after the elections and the, my neighbor, who um, Tom Villa, whose family had uh, controlled the 11th Ward since, I think, 1953, um, all men, uh, he was ready to retire, and he kept asking me, and I just kept laughing, and because my husband and I both work in Jefferson City a lot, so I don't, didn't know how that was going to work, and I also had a seven-month-old baby, um, but my husband really encouraged me, and he uh, came through on being supportive. Heather showed up and helped me, which was huge, and um, I just sort of blindly did it. And, um, I will say I was raised by a widowed single mom who worked a lot. And, um, you know, I think that only had a uh, positive influence on my life as a mom, because you might serve some mac and cheese, but at the end of the day, I think it's a great, uh, influence that you have on your children. And then, but then why do you think that women in particular, why is it so important for women in particular to become involved? I think that women have a, one, it's, it is hard when you're a parent because you have that uh, push and pull, but I think that, um, like Heather said, with the imposter syndrome, we often doubt our own experiences, and women have, just like everyone else, you have experiences, and I think that you can always serve on a board or commission and bring something to the table. You've, you know, been in, in a professional environment, you might have been um, a PTO president and you've seen uh, certain issues, you maybe had trouble with the healthcare system, and women should not deny the experiences they have had. Um, it, they may not have had the typical male experience, you know, you go through your fraternity and you have these connections or you um, go to law school and you run for office like you're supposed to. Um, just because they're not the same traditional experiences doesn't mean that our voices and our 
um, our troubles or hurdles in life don't matter and we don't bring that to the table when making decisions. Maxine, do you agree why it's so important for women in particular to be involved? Yeah, I think so what Sarah said is absolutely correct. Women uh, live so many different lives in one life, a mother, sister, daughter, aunt, cousin, teacher, you know, whatever their career is. And we see so many things. And when you think back on all of the great movements from the polio vaccine to mother seat belts to mothers against drunk driving, it was always women pushing for these important initiatives. And like my mother and her friends all across the country that were pushing in every one of their cities to make it right for children with disabilities to be treated equally, um, that was women. And so we, we understood our political power when it was for social uh, justice and social and human improvement, but we didn't necessarily take it to the um, election. Uh, and then it started to happen. And I think uh, Bella Abzug and the National Council of Jewish Women and the um, Women's Political Caucus all started to really realize that women together can be much better than women apart. And when you look at some of the great candidates that are out there, how long they've been doing it, they were the pioneers. And now um, all you need to do is call a few friends. Uh, Sarah called Heather. Uh, now there's a gigantic group of women you can call in St. Louis, let alone all across the country, that will write you that first check and be supportive and get you going. And so I think absolutely we know how, how life is lived regardless of our age. We've been there, done that, and we can be better represent the the, the masses of people that need our help. Absolutely. Heather, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, I think, I think Sarah and Maxine have covered it. Um, I think that what is important to note though is that when we're talking about policies, um, these aren't just ephemeral things, like especially Sarah and I both serve in local government, but even at the state and federal level, the, the decisions that are made affect the everyday lives of the people who live in our, our cities and our states and our countries. And why, why would we not be there, right? Like, why would we not be there making the decisions about things that are going to impact how we live? So then, Heather, how can women get involved in the political process? So I think there's lots, um, there's lots of ways to get involved and in, um, running for office is not for everyone, although there's, you certainly, if you're interested, there's lots of groups that will help you figure out how to do it. Um, but even serving on boards and commissions or even, um, I think that the best way to start uh, is even if there's something in your own neighborhood that you're not happy with, um, going and contacting your your elected official, um, especially if there's things you're not happy with right now, don't be afraid to call your elected officials and don't be afraid to call them every day. If you elected them, they, they have to hear from you, even if you don't think that they are um, on the side that you are on. And I'll talk a little bit later about ways to advocate for policies and change you want to see through in CJW. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if Maxine or Sarah want to talk about the power of social media in advancing political viewpoints and how does one find the time and learn to do it right? I'll let Sarah start with okay. that. Okay. Uh, well, it's certainly changed a lot, uh, especially since I first got um, involved in politics and um, for the for good and bad, I suppose, with fake news and some of the struggles we see with uh, social media. But it also has made it easier because you can do so much from your home as far as social media goes and find an organization that you believe in, I would say in CJW. And we offer so many opportunities uh, that you can get involved with the click of a mouse. You can write your elected official about issues that matter to you. You can, um, they, I kind of go hot and cold on the call out culture, but it, sometimes that's what it takes. And you can certainly, uh, I don't fully support being an armchair activist, but you know, for a busy uh, professional, you certainly can take quick action with social media, or you can simply share good policies that you believe in or you want people to know about on social media to your friends and your neighbors. Yeah, I would agree. I think that um, as a private citizen now, but as a public, as a running a company for all the years that I ran Build-A-Bear, it just really wasn't, 
it was first of all coming of, coming of age. Social media was just coming of age, but it really wasn't appropriate for me to um, on social media as the founder of Build a Bear and the CEO to really talk about all those things. But now I do it, and now I people still know I'm the founder, and they still know I'm the former chief executive bear, and it actually gives me added credibility. I think people believe anybody who would hug a teddy bear has got to know what she's talking about on social media. So I I do get a lot of credit for that, and I'm. I'm, I'm on there a lot. I mean, I just, I cannot, it, right now it makes me feel better to respond to something that's happening that's not good or I don't think is fair, but particularly around early childhood issues and things that uh, families with children need. There's a ton of organizations across the country that I'm connected with and they um, feed us a lot of good information to share with the world. And I think it's helped in many, many uh, cities, not necessarily St. Louis, unfortunately, but many, many locations uh, activism for children is at, at, at fever pitch right now, and new uh, bills and policies are getting put in for early childhood education, especially um, that m women and mothers and people like myself, business leaders, have advocated now for many years, but now at fever pitch. Definitely. So, what is the most rewarding thing you've gotten from your work, or what are you most proud of? I don't know if Sarah wants to start. Sure. Um, well, I think my biggest initiative, um, in my biggest success as an alderman right now, two things. One, I really worked hard to make it, to make my neighborhood, again, this is just an everyday thing that all moms care about, more pedestrian friendly, that you can walk to the park or wherever you're going with a stroller and not be worried about um, getting hit by a car. So that's one passion I have. And then the other is, a prevailing wage ordinance in the city um, that ensures a level playing field um, for contractors and that it requires any projects incentivized by the city, um, so tax incentives, that they pay their workers prevailing wage, which is kind of like a minimum wage, um, but for construction workers. So it makes it safer, um, it ensures workers have had the right training and um, it also is just important, I think, that we, um, if we are going to incentivize a developer, then that they are paying that, uh, that worker a fair living wage with benefits. Thank you. Heather, do you want to speak to that? Sure. So um, we have a park in, in Creef Core in, in my ward that uh, was formed um, in the, the late 40s. Um, some of you may have heard of it. It used to be named Bernie Park, um, and it was named after the mayor at the time um, who the city council actually pushed a, a number of Black families out. Uh, they weren't interested in having them live in their city. Uh, one family um, stayed and fought and ultimately uh, was not able to, to live there either. Um, when I first joined the council, it, some people, I was aware of it, um, and a couple of people wanted to know if I was interested in changing the name of the park, and I that I wasn't because I felt like we really needed to um, live with our racist park. Like, we can't just whitewash over it and pretend that's not what happened. Um, but then there was a group of advocates and some grassroots support for not just changing the name of the park, uh, but also um, working to, to change some of the culture that's still obviously here in the middle of West County, as well as um, ensure that current generations as well as generations to come understand what happened there, as well as what is the impact um, on our community and on our region. And that's something that we're currently working on um, is how to, um, how to make sure we meet that goal. And we did change the name of the park. I remember that. Maxine. I guess the most obvious is clearly to say that I'm proud of creating uh, Build-A-Bear that created, you know, 6,000 jobs annually every year around the world. But Honestly, I think what the, the most proud is what I've been able to do with the wealth that came from doing that. And one of them is, you know, obviously I'm very involved in K to 12 education, particularly in the city and the North County of St. Louis. And 
today I was just reminded that everything you do makes a difference. And one of our young students at KIPP Victory, which was KIPP uh, Inspire, which was our first KIPP school in St. Louis, and those children are graduating from college now, this year, 2021, that we started in 2009. She sent me an article, she goes to Duke, and she's a senior at Duke, uh, and she sent me an article that was posted in the Duke Law Journal. Um, she's not in law school yet. She's hoping to go to law school. And she was so proud to send me this article. And I've sent it all around the world already today because I'm so proud of her. And what we were able to inspire in the children that came to KIPP and continue to come to KIPP. Um, and there's many stories like that. I could go on for days, but it does, just one makes a difference. You just don't, you, you don't have to. And all of you that run for office and are elected and do mi millions of things for millions of people, but that multiplication factor, and she is going to be an attorney someday, and she will be a successful attorney, hopefully back here in St. Louis, making a difference in her success also for so many children. So for me, it's, it's that one times one times one that we can have such a gigantic impact, and it does make you, you can see the results. It's, it's touchable and it's feelable. That's amazing. And both Heather and Sarah mentioned this about the imposter syndrome, which is the persistent inability to believe that one's success is deserved or has been legitimately achieved as a result, as a result of one's own efforts or skills. Do you have advice for women who might feel this way for all three of you? Um, Heather, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that, I do think women get this more than men. I, um, and there've been lots of studies that show that, and I know definitely, and um, in my household, it is true. And I think that it's just keep moving forward, right? Like think about, we've all, I, I'm looking at just the names and the faces on this call, and it is an amazing group of women there is not a single person on this call who is not accomplished in some some way. So I think that it's one reminding your female friends um, of how much they have and can accomplish because I think we have to lift each other up and the other is is to remember it yourself. Sarah, do you want to answer that? Sure. Uh, last week that. I was on a call with some accomplished lobbyists, some males, <laughs> they're older, uh, very highly regarded, and they were giving um, some updates. And I realized, not that they didn't do a, do a good job, but I realized that I was better informed and had more knowledge about what they were updating all of us on. And so, you know, there it, or that moment it occurred to me, you know, I... I uh, can do what they do. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, we just often fall into that where we just think that we aren't in the know or don't have, don't know as much. And it's just not the case. I also will share a story um, and call out Darian Arnstein a little bit on this, but we had a, our annual legislate NCJW legislative breakfast. And this was several years ago. And a legislator, uh, Darian had asked a question and a legislator got up, a male legislator got up and started kind of pontificating and mansplaining a little bit. And I thought, okay, well, you have no idea how well educated Darian is. And she was very polite, but you know, it, it was this assumption that we were just these nice ladies having this legislative breakfast, when in fact, uh, we knew more than they did. So we just can't let that get the best of us. Uh, we are fully qualified and capable. It may just not be that traditional route, but we are certainly capable of being engaged at all different levels. Definitely. Maxine? Yeah, I had this story that happened to me um, very early in my career in Washington, D.C. One of the women buyers, there were not many, maybe there were four in the whole company, um, ran into me in the ladies' room, and we were just having this quick conversation, which is where a lot of men have conversations and in their men's room, you know. So she said to me, you know, don't, she knew I was going to give a presentation to the senior management. And she said, don't be afraid. They all have to pull their pants down and sit on the toilet the same way you do. And that <laughs> picture just went into my head. And so every time I was ever afraid or thought I wasn't as good as somebody that I was talking to, that picture came into my head. And it really helped me realize that we all are much more equal than we think. And also that 
really what we were, what we all feel and what women always strive to be is just better than, we want to be better than. We don't want to be just good enough or mediocre. We really want to know all the information and we want to have all those 10 qualifications plus more on an application when a guy might only want three. And I think that serves us well. I think that actually, because we're so achievement oriented, um, it serves us well. We have a lot of experience. We bring that to the table and we have compassion and humility, which also, you know, goes a long way. So I've always, I bet I'm telling you that lesson and I've shared it with a lot of young women since then. And they always laugh a little bit, but I think it does give you a perspective, maybe a little bit of a crude one, but it helped me a lot. That will, that, that's a good one. <laughs> and, and by the way, if anyone has questions, I see there's a couple of comments in the chat, but if you have questions for any of the three panel, feel free to put them in the chat and I will ask them. Um, and one thing, Sarah was talking about a point, an appointment project that you wanted to talk about. Do you want to talk sure. about that? So the Women's Foundation of Kansas City that is now, um, I think, United We, I hope that got right, um, they've just recently rebranded. But they started the appointment project um, first with uh, the mayor, Sly James, and uh, actually a good friend of mine, Joni Wickham, who's a, who was the chief of staff, now they're business partners. Um, but it's, uh, it's a project, research-based project, that uh, it encourages women to get involved in a civic level with boards and commissions. And it just goes back to this whole imposter syndrome that you bring, sorry, I think I've got some notifications popping up but you do bring something to the table. Um, you can get involved in planning and zoning. Oops. I think you froze, Sarah. Sorry, I don't know. Oh, there you are. Okay, as long as you can see me. Um, but you can get involved um, on a local level or even a state board and commission. And um, this, the whole premise behind it is increasing gender diversity um, on these civic boards and commissions. And they actually worked with uh, County Executive Sam Page early, I think it was early this year, um, to do the same in the county. And it's also been a passion of Senator Jill Shoops as well. There are so many openings and it's a great way. Um, it's usually only, you know, once a quarter or once a month. And now everybody's meeting by Zoom. And I kind of assume that will continue for a while because it is so convenient. So um, look into that and um, also just look and talk to your local officials and see where there's a good fit for you to serve on one of these commissions. Thank you. We had a question from Amy Hammerman who asked, how did you decide which office to run for or was it more a matter of being asked to do it? Heather, do you want to answer that? Sure. Did someone just ask you? Or you, you said that a couple people approached you. Yeah, I, people approached me and said that I should run, but um, no one asked me to run for the specific seat that I um, ran for. And I think it's a journey, right? I don't, I, I think it's really difficult to, running for office is not an easy thing to do by any stretch. So um, I, I don't think you're gonna have a lot of success if you just wake up one day and pick an office and run. Um, I actually, uh, so years before I ever ran, um, my, someone wanted to build something behind my home that I didn't want there and none of my neighbors wanted there. Um, and lucky for me, my father had worked in um, municipal government for years and years. He was a municipal attorney. Um, when I was young, um, his meetings were at night because uh, that's when local government meetings are. Um, and my mom was in real estate and she showed houses at night because that's when you show homes. And so it was way easier for my dad to like sit me in the back of a meeting room and no one to know that I was there than when my mother was out showing homes to sit me in the car. Her clients would definitely know I was there. <laughs> so um, I had a pretty good idea of how these meetings flowed and what I needed to do to try and stop it. Um, and so I got all of my neighbors together and we signed a letter that we took to the Board of Adjustment and I um, created a whole report and went and presented to the Board of Adjustment. And after the meeting, the staff said, uh, we have two spots open on the board, do you want one? Um, and I had just had 
uh, twins. And I thought, well, this would be, I was like, not, you kind of lose yourself after you have kids. And I wanted to do like an adult like thing. And I thought, well, they only meet like a couple of times a year. This is a great way to like have something that is just about being an adult. Um, we were living in Olivet at the time. And uh, when we moved, I had found that I really enjoyed serving my community like that. Um, and when we moved to Creve Corps, I wanted to do the same. Um, and so I applied to be on the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, and in Creve Corps, it was very different. Like I had to apply and there was an interview and it was, um, it was a bigger thing than just somebody asking me to do it. And while I was sitting on the Planning and Zoning Commission, it occurred to me that there hadn't been a contested election in Creve Corps in like six years. And that's just not a great way um, to, to get people involved in, in government. Um, and I'm really passionate about local government because I feel like it's the government that is the closest to the people. And it is where you can really make the most difference in individual lives if, if that's what you're interested in. So um, I ran against an incumbent um, and, and won by 13 points, which I was pretty excited about, but I was more excited about the number of people who paid attention to the election and also used that as a way to talk about what they wanted for their community. Wow. Sarah? Uh, I'll be honest, I was begged. <laughs> Okay, I but wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I did it. Um, I enjoy it. I enjoy just meeting people I wouldn't meet otherwise and learning more about my neighborhood and surrounding areas. And uh, like Heather, I grew up, uh, my mom was a lawyer, so I had to go to a lot of nighttime court hearings or sit in the, the middle of the courthouse. So um, it, I wasn't a stranger to those types of meetings. And I just thought, okay, this, um, you know, the, the campaign, honestly, I'll be, just to be completely honest with people, the campaign is really the worst part of it, I think, because that's just very stressful. And once you get past that, I mean, of course, there's a learning curve, but you get into a group of things and you make, especially kind of a part-time legislative position, um, like Heather's and mine, you get into a group of things and you learn to set your own boundaries and um, kind of mold it to fit your life. And Maxine, if you were running for an office, let's say, which you're not too old, I say, but <laughs> uh, is there something that you would have chosen or run for in particular? State? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Honestly, I really like supporting candidates. And recently I've been able, this since uh, COVID, to get involved with candidates all across the country and you know, zoom into their meetings that they're having. I just left one before I came here. And it, they are amazing. I mean, it's really, you are right about local government. And now these are mostly um, House of Representative seats and they're about as local as I've been able to get in those kinds of races. But I am encouraged by how many young people, smart people um, who, who have given up you know, good practi law practices and medical practices and other jobs to come and do this work. And that's really what I probably wasn't willing to do. I had such a great career and I wanted to continue to do it. Um, so it just didn't appeal to me. But I do believe that where, when there are people that want to do it, we have to get behind them and help them. And um, the campaign is probably the worst part. You know, that's the part. But I will tell you that um, there's a lot of incredible people in running for office. And some of them are in close races. Even uh, people that we would support are in really close races right now. And it's important to get, find those candidates and, and give them that extra $10. It doesn't matter. I think sometimes when it comes from out of state, it's more appreciated than when it's local because they want to know how you found out. And that's how I got involved with this particular candidate in Northern New, Jer New Jersey. But, you know, I found out that he really, he was threatened and I didn't want him not to be there. And it was as important as any of the local races here in Missouri when things are, are they're supposedly local, but they're also national. And he would have a vote that would make a big difference in our lives, especially around healthcare. So anyway, I think that I'm just glad to be able to have so much curiosity. That's my superpower. Uh, that I have the willingness to go and go to do all these things and meet all these people and share their story with others so that others will contribute as well. So for me, that's the joy of it right now. And I think it's come, it's come into its own. I think the, the fact that we're Zooming together today and so many candidates 
have been using this technique and have brought in so much money because they've been able to touch the hearts and souls of regular people like us that um, it's, it's been quite a, a new uh, technique to use. And I think it'll bode well for us in the future. I definitely agree. I agree. Thank you. And at this point, we wanted to show one more video um, entitled One Vote to show how important every single vote actually is and the impact that one vote can have on an election. So I'm going to have Lauren take it away to the next video. Women had to really fight to be able to vote. And so now we have the voice. It's like you want to push the mute button. I think that's a little shocking. What were they doing? You know, you have time to vote. You can vote early. You can vote at the poll. I think it's, I, I'm surprised, 22 million. If I don't vote, I can't complain about <laughs> whoever's in office if they're not representing me. I really can't complain because I never said what I thought in the first place should happen. Well, you're basically saying, do with me what you will. And you're talking about total strangers all, all around this country. You're saying to them, just do what you want and I'll just be happy with it. I'm just going to settle for whatever you think my life should be like. That's what you're saying if you don't vote. There were so many people that came before us who were not able to vote. There were people who actually gave up their lives in order that we would have the right to vote. Women won the right to vote in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. The margin of victory for the amendment was one vote in one state legislature. The year that I won my Senate seat in the state legislature, it was a matter of 14 votes as to whether I was in the majority or the minority party. Uh, by 14 votes, someone from the other party won his election for state senate. 14 votes. I believe my vote makes a difference and I'm going to do it. I'm going to go out there and say, you know what? This is what I think. And you have to listen to me. <laughs> 22 million single women could get together and cast a vote. I think that we could all feel the effects of that. I mean, I'm sure we could. It's a lot of people. One voice may be considered a singer, but lots of voices can be a chorus. We can create a symphony together if we just step forward, do your best, and that's the only way you can hope to change anything. Thank you. Um, right now we wanted to turn it over to Heather Silverman because she wanted to take a few minutes to talk about how to take action, um, vote no on number three, and just go through a couple of important items for us. Yeah, so I'm, I am gonna take a moment after that video just um, I'm going to talk about things that we can do right after the election and then move into to back into something that things that we can do like when you hang up from this call. Um, so I think what's really important to to remember um, about the election is that we all are feeling a lot of pressure right and and there's a lot of turmoil right now. And for those of us who've been at this for a while, we're used to sort of election day comes and there's like this pressure release. Um, there's a good chance we're not gonna get that this year just because of the, um, the fact that our elections have been called into question in terms of their validity um, because it's like 
lead that we're not going to have election results right away. Um, and so I think what we do immediately following that election is really important. And I think that ensuring um, that we um, call out for, for the processes um, that we have to take place in order um, to, to identify who our elected officials should be um, is going to be incredibly important moving forward. So, um, and definitely you will be hearing more from NCJW on that and how you, you can help um, as we get closer to election day and beyond. Uh, first and foremost, if you signed up for this call, we will be adding you to our five ways to advocate list. So every week, uh, Jen Bernstein puts together an email that hits your inbox on Monday morning that will tell you just what you can do that day to make a difference. Um, if you don't want to be added, make sure to contact Lauren. If not, we will definitely get you on there for next Monday. Um, one thing that's really important, I'm sure you all have um, been paying attention in this whirlwind of things that's happening right now, um, that we have a Senate that is trying to push through a Supreme Court nomination and we are how many days before an election? So I know that Senator Hawley and Senator Blunt have come out how they feel about this, but what they don't know is how you feel. You need to call them, you need to call them today, you need to call them tomorrow, and you need to let them know that it, we are way too close for an election to um, be confirming a Supreme Court nomination. In addition, while we, we all hope that you will vote no on Amendment 3, um, also known as Dirty Missouri, it is the repeal of Clean Missouri. Um, it has really confusing ballot language so it's really important that uh, you make sure that your friends and family understand how to vote and that really this is not about getting rid of lobbyist gifts, but it is about being able to easily gerrymander districts. Um, in addition, there are a number of um, groups who um, are doing text banks and phone banks. Uh, Missouri Jobs with Justice has a number of um, has a number of opportunities. I'm gonna put in or Jen, can you put uh, Cody's email in the chat? Thanks. Um, so Jen will drop an email in the chat of who you can contact if you want to um, if you want to volunteer with them. In addition, on election day, election protection, if you haven't heard about it, it ensures that anyone who comes to the poll and is prepared to vote has the ability to do so. Um, they are always looking for, um, they are always looking for volunteers. And that is what I've got that you can do to today to take action. Jen, is there anything I missed? that you can think of. I see Jen put um, the information that you were talking about in the chat. Okay. As well as- uh, Oh, one, one thing I did wanna add, if anyone does need their ballot notarized and you um, can't make it to one of the libraries, I'm gonna put my cell phone number in here and my email address. Um, I am in the office, actually starting next week, I'll be here Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Um, and I'm in the office from eight to three. Um, but if it's on a weekend, just shoot me an email or text me and I'm happy to notarize it for you. I'll come meet you somewhere, like at a Starbucks or something and, and do it for you. So I'm gonna put my email and my cell phone in here. Thank you, thank you, Jen. Um, and I'm just looking at the chat. So if anyone has any other questions before we close out, but I see that Amy Heron said, if you haven't already done so, please reach out to your loved ones and make sure that they know their, what their plan is to vote, absolutely, and where to go, et cetera. And Jen just put her information in the chat. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions for any of our panel or about Anything? I'm gonna look through here really fast. 
Okay. Okay. Well, thank you again to all of our panelists and for taking the time away from their busy schedules. We appreciate it. And we hope everyone learned something. Oh, I see someone else is available to notarize. Um, we hope that people have learned something today and you can, you know, you can do something to make a difference in our community and get involved and be sure to join us for our next few membership sessions. There's coffee talk. I see Susan's on here, Katzman, October 27th. Can I say who our special guest is, Susan? I'm saying it, it's the Sklar brothers from St. Louis. <laughs> and then we have 77 days election to inauguration on November 5th from 5.30 to 6.30. Coffee talk is from 8.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.